I woke up last night when I heard a stealthy scraping sound outside my door. It was locked. I always lock it. I have since I was a kid, but that didn't stop something from trying the knob, from trying to get me. I sat in bed, petrified, even after I heard the rustle, shuffle of it moving away dejectedly. I couldn't move. I couldn't think. Just breathing existed was enough of an effort right then. So I sat there, staring at the door, waiting for the thing to come back or find another way in. It knew I was in there, and I didn't believe it would ever really give up. I knew too well for that. I barely remember my mother. She died away from home when I was five years old, and the best explanation I ever got for what happened to her was an accident. A terrible, terrible accident. What memories I have of her are faded and strange for the most part, but I do have one specific memory that I suspect is actually some amalgam of different memories and things that I've added from what I've been told and my own imagination. It's the image of her sitting in her sewing room, working on a dress. My father said she only made dresses as a hobby, but that she was very talented. That may be, but in my memory, from what I remember, the most is how grateful and poised she seems as her hands dart this way and that with a needle. How beautiful her voice is as she sings absently along with the rhythm of her work. And most importantly, how I can't understand how she can work so close to the mannequin and not see those shiny red beetles climbing out of its skin. If the end of my experiences with my mother resides at the edge of my early childhood memory, it shares the space with my first memories of the mannequin. From what I understand, it had once belonged to my grandfather when he was a teacher in a medical school up north. When he died of a heart attack at 52, my mother took it as part of her inheritance. A full-sized, anatomically correct doll of a woman. At one time, it had been a state-of-the-art teaching aid, as it was remarkably lifelike and had panels in the front and back of the torso so they could be removed to reveal a fully realized interior full of metal ribs and leather lungs, rubber arteries, and silken folds of intestine. Externally, it had been modeled after a beautiful lady, though with time, the painted lips had faded and the smooth skin had become mottled with discoloration. Many people would have found it creepy or grotesque, but my mother supposedly loved it. It reminded her of her father, but it also served a purpose for her as well. She used it as a perfect, infinitely patient dress model in her sewing room. At some point after my mother died, my father brought the mannequin to stay in my room. I don't ever remember him talking to me about it beforehand, but I do remember walking in one morning to see the tall, blank-faced, naked woman standing in the corner of my bedroom, staring at me. My father had rushed in and then let out a small laugh when he saw what I was yelling about. He apologized for scaring me with it, telling me that it was meant to be a happy thing, not a scary thing, something to help me remember my mother and keep her with us. You should talk to it when you can. I know that sounds silly, but if you get down or lonely or even just bored, well, just talk to the mannequin a little. Like you were talking to your mother. Okay? I looked up at my father. I remember this clearly because it was the first time I ever felt worried about something that he was doing. The first time I ever questioned if my father was wrong. But it's creepy. I don't like it. Please, take it out. My father just stared at me for a moment before patting my leg. I understand you feel that way now, sweetness, but that will change with time. Before you know it, you'll be used to having it around and would miss it if it were gone. My father was wrong about that, at least partially. I did get somewhat used to it over the next couple of years, but I never liked it or tried to talk to it, and I certainly wouldn't have missed it had it disappeared. I just ignored it, treated it like it didn't exist for the sake of pleasing my father. I know it may sound dumb, but when I was little, I felt like pleasing him. 
excepting the mannequin in my room and loving my mother were all tied together. That if I didn't want the mannequin around, it would look like I didn't miss my mother or care about his feelings. So I just kept quiet and ignored it as best I could for the next couple of years. And then one day, during my first month of second grade, I came home crying. A couple of girls who I'd thought were close friends had been mean to me, said I was ugly and my family was weird, that my mother had probably run off because I was so weird. It made me so mad and so sad and so guilty, and I wanted to tell my father about it, but when I got home, no one was there. Most days, my father would be home by the time I got off the bus, but on Fridays, he had to work late. This Friday, I sat alone in my bedroom, sniffling, trying to convince myself that those girls were just mean liars and not quite succeeding. Maybe we were weird. Maybe my mother had just gotten enough and decided to run away after all. Just then, I noticed the mannequin out the corner of my eye. I kept it covered up with an old coat of my mother's most of the time, but its head was still bare and I could see the marble gleam of its eyes staring at me from the corner of the room. Out of reflex, I almost turned away and pushed the thing from my mind, but then I didn't, because I needed my mother. I could tell my father about what had happened, and he would listen, but he wouldn't really understand much as he might try. I needed to talk to her, but since she wasn't here... I went and knelt down in front of the mannequin. The details of my seven-year-old drama isn't important. What is important is that over the next two hours, I poured my heart out to this thing. At first, it felt awkward and dumb, but by the end of it, I was happy and excited, babbling along until I heard the front door open as my father came home. For whatever reason, I didn't tell him about it, even though I sensed he'd be happy that I was finally talking to the doll like he'd suggested so long ago. Instead, I kept my secret deep in my chest, thrilling and warming me with the anticipation of my next conversation with my new friend. The next few months were some of the strangest and happiest of my life. I would talk to the mannequin in the mornings before school and again in the afternoons. Most nights, I would talk to it for a while after I was supposed to be in bed. It was like a switch had been flipped. Once I started doing it, I felt like it was something I'd always done. It never felt odd or artificial. I didn't mind the way the doll looked at me anymore. Sure, its eyes just stared and its skin had places where it was cracking. The skin on its hands and neck were starting to crack. Seeing this upset me, but at the time I assumed that my father could fix anything, so I just decided I had to find a good time and tell him about me making friends with the mannequin. Tell him that he needed to fix her so she was good as new. The idea of her cleaned and repaired and freshly painted cheered me up some, but I was still worried as I fell asleep that night. I can't say what woke me up a few hours later. Maybe a sound or a smell or... Possibly just the sense that something was happening. An acid current in the air that said change was coming or a storm was near. Sitting up in bed, I looked around in the dark for anything out of place. That's when I saw the light coming from behind the mannequin. It was a gray colorless light so dim that it would have been invisible during the day. But in the depths of the night... I could see it pulsing slowly, rhythmically, against the walls like a diseased heartbeat. I should have been afraid, but some combination of my sleepiness and my recent devotion to the mannequin made me more curious than fearful. I eased out of the bed and crept over to the mannequin, and as I got closer and edged around the rear of the doll, I could see the light was flaring from the back of its neck, from a series of lines there. At first, I worried it was more cracks, but they looked different. Funny. I pulled over a chair and stood on it for a better look. It looked like a weird J with a line run through it and part of a sideways triangle cutting through that at different points. 
It should have seemed like nonsense lines, but somehow it didn't. It wasn't a mistake, it was a plan. It wasn't a crack, it was a mark. And the light coming from it was tugging at me, at something inside me. I tried to back away, but I couldn't move. I could feel it pulling me down. I woke up in a cold sweat, and after a panicked glance around my room, I realized it must have all been a dream. I was just worried about the mannequin and telling my father, and the anxiety had given me a weird dream about it all. I looked back at the doll, studying it more now that it was calmer. The cracks were worse, much, much worse. The face, the legs, and what I could see of the torso underneath my mother's coat were all spiderwebbed with thick, black cracks I could see from my bed. Forcing myself not to panic again, I got out of bed and eased over to it. For the first time in months, I was a little afraid of it, but I was also afraid for it. It looked like it might just break apart at any moment. Reaching out, I parted the coat slightly to gently touch its once smooth stomach, now a mosaic of cracks like dry, broken desert ground. As the tip of my finger made contact, I heard and felt a rough skittering coming from inside the doll. It was a raspy, unpleasant noise, as though something was struggling to get out of the doll, struggling to get to me. I recoiled, and as I took a step back, the oblong patch of stomach I'd touched fell in, leaving a ragged, dark hole where the mannequin's skin had been. It was as I took another step back that the first red leg crept over the edge of that hole. My scalp tingled and my ears buzzed as I watched the red beetle crawl out of the opening, first followed by another, and then a pair, and then a steady stream. They crawled on the thing's broken skin, they burrowed into the thick wool coat, and they fell onto the floor and started aimlessly crawling toward me. Screaming, I ran downstairs to find my father sitting in the kitchen eating cereal. He smiled at me as I came around the corner his eyes raising as he saw how I looked. Whoa, what's the matter, honey? I could barely talk. B bugs, in my room, bugs. He let out a chuckle as he swept me up in a hug. That's okay, baby, I'll take care of it. I held on to him, telling him not to go, but he just smiled and gently pried me free. It's okay, I said. Stay here while I go look. Where in the bedroom did you see the bugs? I wanted to say mannequin, but I couldn't somehow. After several tries, I had to settle for a corner. He nodded. I'll be right back. And he was. Less than five minutes later, he came back, his expression serious but slightly amused as he sat me down on the table. Honey, I checked and didn't see any bugs, but I'll call the exterminator out today and get everything sprayed real good. It'll be a bug-free house by tonight, I promise. I tried to argue, to say that he didn't understand that something was wrong up there, something was wrong with the doll, but he cut me off with a shake of his head. No, we have to go now or you'll be late for school. Go get dressed, baby. Daddy, I don't want to go back in there. He puffed out a breath and looked at the oven clock. Okay, I'll get you something out and you can get dressed down here. But no more bug talk, okay? I'll have everything fixed up before you get home today. Deal? I could feel the pressure of his stare as I fought down the urge to try and make him understand again. It didn't matter. He wasn't going to believe me anyway. So I nodded and after I changed in the bathroom, he took me to school. I was miserable all day, worried about the doll, worried about me and my dad being in that house, worried that there was something wrong with me and I was just crazy. I didn't fully know what crazy meant back then, but I knew it was bad. It could get you sent away from home or make you hurt people and I didn't want anyone getting hurt, especially me and my father. My stomach was aching by the time I got back to the bus stop that afternoon and it was hard to make myself get up and get off when we reached my stop. The house looked normal from the outside, but that didn't count for much. 
It's what was inside that mattered, crawling in the dark spaces in between. Shuddering at the thought, I walked slowly up to the front door as I fished my key out of my pocket. It was Friday again, so I knew that Dad wouldn't be home, but... The door suddenly opened. Standing there inside was a beautiful, smiling woman. She reminded me some of my memory of my mother, but she also reminded me of someone else. Of... something else. The mannequin opened the door wider as she stepped aside. Well, come on in, honey. How was school today? I didn't run, though I don't know why. Maybe it was because of how welcoming she was. How beautiful. Or it could be I was too scared to turn my back, afraid that whatever this woman doll truly was, she would run me down and tear me apart, filling my mouth and ears and eyes with hundreds of those tiny red legs and questing jaws. Or maybe it's because of how right it all felt. Because if I'm honest, I wasn't confused or scared. I was overwhelmed with the same sense of relief you have when you wake up from a bad dream and realize that the worst version of life has fallen away from you. I knew the woman standing in front of me with her perfect skin and her warm brown eyes wasn't my mother. I knew she had somehow come from the mannequin, which meant that she was magic somehow and something other than human. But when she bent down and gave me a gentle hug, it still made my heart hammer with joy. When I smelt a faint aroma of a perfume that, well, I don't know what my mother might have smelled like, but I imagined it was just like that mingled scent of vanilla and honeysuckle. And when she laughed and talked to me, really seeing me listening as I allowed myself to be led inside, there was one thought that thrummed deep and resonant in the center of my heart. I was finally home. I was worried about what my father's reaction would be to a strange woman in his house, but Marisol, that was her name, she told me with a grin, assured me that she would handle it and it would all be okay. It was strange. We talked a lot in the two hours before he got home, but we never actually talked about it. Where she had come from, what she actually was, or anything else related to the strangeness of it all. It was as though there was an unspoken understanding between us. Two old friends who knew the score and were happy enough with each other's company to ignore the questions it raised. Whether my father would be so laid back, that might be a different matter entirely. When Dad came home and saw us sitting in the living room, his first reaction was surprise. He made an awkward greeting and then asked me who my friend was. When I told him that it was Marisol, and she was supposed to stay with us, he looked funny for a moment, as though remembering some hard-to-digest fact or idea. His eyes widened slowly as he looked at Marisol again, and then me. Honey, come here for a minute, please. He took me out of the front hallway and knelt down. Is this who I think it is? I felt relief that he recognized her too. Yes, Daddy, it's the mannequin. Or she came from the mannequin at least. I haven't been upstairs to see if the doll is gone or not. He swallowed, glancing back to the living room nervously. Has she hurt you or done anything bad? I frowned and shook my head. No, Daddy, she's real sweet. She wants to stay with us and I want her to too. Rubbing his lips, he gave a dry laugh. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see. I need to talk to her, try to understand this more. I'd given up thinking it would work, and seeing it here, he met my eyes. Do you think she came from the bunks you saw this morning? I shrugged, not liking the reminder of what I'd seen. I don't know. I don't see how. She looks like the doll, not a bug, and she's nice. I paused and then added, She makes me happy. My father's face softened and he gave a nod. 
I, I understand, baby. I'm not saying she can't stay. Not yet, but I have to talk to her. Check her out some. You stay out here for a bit, and I'll take her in the kitchen, okay? I started to nod when he grabbed my arms gently. Baby, if you hear anything scary or anything bad happens, you do not stay here or try to help. You run down to the road to the neighbor's house, okay? Tell them to call someone. The police, I guess. You understand? I nodded, worry stirring in my stomach. Not that she would try to hurt us, but that my father might get scared and make her leave. I promise, but it'll be okay, Daddy. He gave me a weak smile before leaning forward to kiss my forehead. I hope so. Just sit tight until I get you. Standing back up, he went to the living room and asked Marisol to talk to him in the kitchen. The time waiting for them to come back seemed to drag on forever, but when they finally did come back, I could tell things had worked out. They both seemed happy, and they told me my father had agreed Marisol could stay with us on a trial basis. We turned my mother's old sewing room into a guest bedroom, and we'd see how things went from there. They glanced at each other when he said this, and even then, I had thought that he liked her too. That just like me, he was tired of being lonely. At night, we had a big dinner and stayed up late, and when they finally carried me up to bed, I noticed that the corner of my room was bare. Smiling at Marisol sleepily, I reached out and touched her hair. It really is you, isn't it? She nodded, her eyes twinkling in the dark. It is sweetness. Now, get some sleep. The following morning, I woke up in a panic, sure that the day before had just been a wonderful dream. But then, I smelled breakfast cooking and laughter from downstairs. I rushed down the stairs as I had the day before, but when I rounded the corner this time, I saw my father and Marisol talking and joking around as they cooked breakfast. Even at seven, there was a part of me that knew this was all very strange. How could we be comfortable with something like this, particularly so quickly? The best answer I had was that it was part of the magic of Marisol being there at all, a wonderful magic that had made us a real family again overnight. I know this makes me sound as though I was either very naive or willfully blind, and both are probably a bit true, but I wasn't an idiot. Over the days and weeks that followed, I always kept a close watch on Marisol and my father. I could never completely shake my memories of the mannequin glowing or what had come out of it, and it prevented me from entirely trusting her at first, despite my strong desire to just give in to our new life entirely. But she really did seem good and nice. She was always kind and fun, and just being around her made you feel happy and safe. And it was good to see my father smile again, really smile and really laugh, not just the fake stuff he'd always done for my benefit. I hadn't known the difference before, but I did now, and I couldn't imagine going back to the way things had been for either of us. When, after a couple months, Marisol stopped staying in the guest room and started staying with my father, I understood on some level what that meant. They started giving each other odd looks and would whisper when they thought I didn't notice. They'd hold hands and sit close, and it made me happy because I could tell that my father loved her as much as I did, and that meant Marisol was here to stay. It's funny that I have such clear memories of all of this. My ability to remember and even my perception of time has never seemed to dull. If anything, I might recall things more clearly than I think is natural. I can look back at almost any point in the last 30 years and see the day as though I was reliving it. From the day Marisol came to us up until now, as I write this all down. It's funny, because despite all that clarity, it took almost two years from that first day with Marisol for me to realize that after that day, we'd never left the house again. I never went to school, my father never left to go to work, no one had ever visited or come to check on us. We had food and water and lights. We even had the same handful of channels on TV, but we never, ever actually left. That thought, that terrible and strange epiphany was hard for me to understand and even harder to hold on to. 
It was like a slippery fish or a bar of soap. The harder I tried to grasp the idea and keep it, the more it would squirt through my fingers, sometimes not returning for days or even weeks. I finally figured out that so long as I didn't look at it directly, it would stay around a bit longer. With practice, I managed to keep it in the corner of my mind's eye longer and longer, and after a few months, I was able to remember our imprisonment long enough to ask my father about it. He was sitting by himself in my mother's old sewing room, though I suppose its last job had been as Marisol's room for a short time. Standing at the door of the room, I was struck by how sad and lost he looked. It reminded me of all the recent times I'd seen glimpses of that same forlorn sadness in him when he didn't think I was looking. I paused for a second and heard a sound from downstairs. Marisol was down there watching a movie, or that's what it sounded like. My father looked up as I gently shut the door behind me. He started to put on a smile when I blurted out my question before I could lose it again. Did you know that we're always here? We never leave the house, not ever. His face paled as the smile fell away. Lowering his eyes, he nodded. I know. Sometimes I know. It's gotten more and more in the last few months where I can remember. He looked up, his expression fearful. I've asked Marisol about it. She just laughs and asks why we would want to leave. We have everything we could want right here. I found myself wanting to nod to agree with her, but I forced myself to stop. I didn't know where I ended and she began anymore, and it frightened me. We have a good life, Dad. But that's not right, is it? We should be able to go out, right? See people and part of the world like normal. Isn't that the way it was before? I left off. Marisol came to live with us, but it still hung in the air between us like a poison cloud. He nodded, his eyes glimmering. I think so, sweetie. I have trouble thinking about it a lot of the time, but I'm pretty sure this isn't right. I... I think I trapped us here, and I don't know how to get us out. He started crying openly, and I went over to give him a hug. It's not your fault, Daddy. It's Marisol. She needs to let us go if we want, at least sometimes. He shook his head against my shoulder. You don't understand. I knew what she was when this started. Or, well, I didn't know exactly, but I had some idea. It's my fault she came to life. I never knew your grandfather. Not really. His name was Richard Murphy, and I only met him once right after me and your mom got married. He was a very intense and intimidating man, though perfectly friendly and polite that one evening. While most of your mother's family lives a couple of hundred miles north of here in a town called Empire, they practically own the place. Your grandfather, he was always off somewhere, either teaching or traveling. Your mother never talked bad about him, but I could tell she was afraid of him. Afraid of something he was a part of. It wasn't until he was declared dead that I found out what that was. Your mother didn't just inherit the mannequin from him. She got money, some property, and his private collection of... Well, I know it sounds weird, but he had a lot of magical type stuff. Not like a magician pulls a rabbit out of his hat. I mean, old books, strange artifacts, bad and creepy stuff. I didn't see all of it at the time, but I saw enough to agree with your mother that it had no place in our house. She rented a storage unit in town and kept it there until she was gone. Everything except the doll. At the time, I thought it was just her being sentimental. Now, I feel sure it was part of some manipulation, either by that thing or your grandfather. She grew strange after the mannequin came to live with us. She'd have terrible dreams and there were times where she'd disappear for hours or even days at the time. The last time she left, she'd... She never came back at all, and it wasn't until weeks later that I got the call that she'd been found dead outside a bus station in Kansas. I'm sorry to talk to you about this so bluntly, honey. I, I know you're still young, but I've lied and hidden things for too long, and I need to be honest if we're going to have any chance of beating... 
whatever the hell all this is. When I got the call about your mother, I, I went a little crazy. I started having strange dreams myself, and I became obsessed with the idea that maybe she really wasn't dead, that she was mixed up in some strangeness with her father, and that my best chance of figuring out what was going on was in that storage unit. You may not remember it now, but I didn't actually tell you that she had died or start preparing for the funeral until she had already been gone for nearly three weeks. The last two weeks of that time, I spent pouring through the sick filth I found in the storage unit. There were many times where I just wanted to say it was all made-up silliness, the fantasies of one or more diseased minds. But something... Something kept driving me, some understanding that it was real. There was real magic in those books and drawings, real power in the rituals they described. And storage units, if the writings were to be believed, was full of tools that could do many wonderful and terrible things. And one of the greatest of those tools was already sitting in our house. Looking back now, I don't remember half of what I did. I'd like to say I was just under something's control, and maybe that was some of it, but I do know I wanted to do it. The rituals to prepare the mannequin, putting it in your room and encouraging you to talk to it. That was the final ingredient, you see. For it to work, it needed to be believed in and loved by another. Loved as though it was the dead person you were trying to bring back, but it wouldn't work for me to be the one. I couldn't do the rituals and be the catalyst for the spell. That left you. The way it was supposed to work, the way it was described in the books, is that if you grew to believe in it and love it, the mannequin could develop a connection to a spirit. In this case, I'd done rituals to make sure the connection would be with your mother, if she was really dead and nothing else if she wasn't. But if everything worked out, she could use the doll to talk and move for brief periods of time. I know how crazy it sounds, but I believed it at the time. I had had dreams that told me things I couldn't learn from the books, and between that and the rituals, with every day I moved more from mourning her loss to anticipating her return. Still, even though I was half crazy with grief and so very short-sighted and selfish, I, I couldn't make myself push you. I put the mannequin in your room, yes, I told you to talk to it if you wanted, and initially I intended to remind you about it, encourage it, even force you if I needed to, justifying all of it with the idea that if it worked, we could get your mother back, at least after a fashion. But I couldn't do it. Every time I went to push you, I felt such shame and guilt. I felt like I was tricking you, pulling you into something, well, something evil or unnatural. I felt dirty from ever starting down the path, and I certainly didn't want you following me. There were a dozen times I almost took that doll out of your room, but something always held me back. Maybe it was the same thing sending me those dreams, or maybe it was just me being a selfish coward. I, I don't know. Either way, as time went on, I gave up on it working. Even when I noticed that you were starting to talk to it some, I didn't really expect anything to come from it. I'd accepted that magic wasn't real, and my attempts at it had just been my really bad way of dealing with how much I missed your mom. Then that morning, you came down screaming about bugs. I tried to hide it, but I was really scared when I first went upstairs and wasn't sure what I'd find. But nothing seemed out of place. I really did think you'd just seen a roach or something, and I was relieved. When I came home and she was here, well, you know how that turned out. Now we just have to try and find a way to get free. I won't have my little girl trapped here for the rest of her life. I swear to you, I'll find a way to get you out of here. I'd listened quietly as my father poured out his heart in front of me. I knew he was sorry, and I didn't doubt what he was saying. I'd seen enough and knew enough to believe in magic without any convincing. And a part of me did want to be free, to not have my life controlled and confined by whatever Marisol actually was, to not have my father tormented by remembering 
more and more that our corner of heaven was actually a prison cell. But then that was the problem, wasn't it? It really was heaven in a lot of ways. I was really happy most of the time. Why did I want to escape that? So I could have a life where people were mean and die and scared me all the time? I knew it was harder on him, maybe because he was older, or maybe because Marisol liked me better and kept me from remembering the bad parts most of the time. But this is what he wanted, wasn't it? To be a happy family and stay together forever? Why should he take it away from us now? So I went downstairs and found Marisol. And I told her daddy was trying to get away. He comes to my door every night now. It's funny because for the last few years I hardly see him at all. He stays away from us. Marisol moved back out of his room when I was a teenager and now most of the time she just stands in her old corner at night watching over me while I sleep. That's what I don't get. He knows she's in here. He has to, but he still waits until the middle of the night tries to get in or cries outside the door begging for me to make it stop. Every couple of weeks, Marisol makes you remember everything again for a little while. It's always hard, but I've gotten used to it. It's always the same thing. The initial shock and fear, worrying about what to do, and then realizing that, truth be told, I wouldn't have it any other way. Each period of remembering ends the same way, too, with her asking me if I want her to end my father's time in the house. To finally answer his pleas and end his suffering with the understanding that if I do that, my own memories and suffering will grow worse to make up for his absence. She strokes my hair and tells me that the offerings must continue, and if I don't fully understand what she means, I still get the general idea. And when she asks the question, I no longer give an answer. I just get up and lock my bedroom door. Aside from television, the only other portal we have to the outside world are our windows. Marisol says the truth of our home's interior cannot be seen from the outside world, and in most ways, the world has forgotten the house exists at all. But we can still see out. I can look at the farmland trailing off into the distance or the occasional car passing on the road. I can wake up early and watch the sun rise or fall asleep to the sound of owls hooting out in the nighttime field of stars. Our nearest neighbor is too far to even see, and the road is quiet, so most of the time it's like the entire world, inside and out, is just for us. But then, just a few weeks ago, a man appeared in the front yard. He looked a little younger than me and was dressed in a brown suit with a wide-brimmed brown hat to match. He reminded me a little of a gangster from one of those old movies Dad used to like. I watched him for a moment, wondering how he'd found the house and what he was doing there. Was he a salesman or something? I knew Marisol would keep him out, but I still didn't like him wandering around our property. Then he looked up at me and waved. Letting out a gasp, I stepped back, right into Marisol. I turned up and looked at her. He saw me. He saw me and waved. I could hear the raw panic in my voice, but Marisol just gave me a soft laugh and rubbed my back. It's all right, honey. That's only right. That's your grandfather, you see. I know he looks younger and different, but that's him all right. He's come back around, as I knew he would. I felt a stir of excitement, but I was still tinged with fear. Why is he here? Is he going to change things? Is he going to make you go away? Mirasol's skin shifted slightly as something moved underneath her normally taut cheek. Meeting my eyes, she shook her head slightly. I don't think so, no. I think we'll stay right here. In fact, I expect the work your grandfather has won't involve us directly at all. She pointed as he ducked down and opened an access panel that led underneath the house. See? He's got important work down there. We'll stay up here, where it's comfortable. The man she said was my grandfather came and went several times over the next few weeks, and giving me a wave, nothing more. I was starting to grow used to it, to even enjoy the visit slightly, when they stopped as quickly as they began. Things went back to normal, 
until one day I heard Marisol talking to someone in the kitchen. I went in, wondering if my father had finally decided to be sociable again. Instead, she was holding something and talking into it. It took me a moment to remember what it was, because aside from the TV, I hadn't seen someone use a telephone in 30 years. No, dear, I understand the distinction. I know what I want. The crawl space needs to be completely sealed and climate controlled. I was given your number as the one for the job. When can you send someone out? The young man they sent from the air conditioner company couldn't see us the way the other man could. He came out the first time, and then he came back today. This time, he even made a point of staring in the windows. Dad did come down for that, pounding on the glass and screaming half an inch from the boy's face, but he never saw or heard anything. Then he went back underneath the house to begin the work Marisol had asked for. I've written this account over the course of several days, and now that I think about it, I started it the first time that boy came out. He's handsome, and more importantly, he has a kind face. The kind of face that makes me feel lonely in a way that I'm not used to and that I don't like at all. I don't know how many times he's going to come out here, and I wonder if I could convince Marisol that we should let him stay. I hear the crawl space door opening again. I'll write more after I get another look at him. I'll talk to you soon. The proceeding has been reproduced here from handwritten pages found remarkably unburned in the ruins of a house fire that occurred on April 19th. 2005. The author of the pages is unknown. Thankfully, at the time of the fire, the house had been unoccupied for years. Okay, so that was The Mannequin by Brandon Fairclaw. If you watched the last No Sleep video, I'm pretty sure you picked up on that connection there at the end. Um, let me know what you thought about this story in the comments section below. Let me know if you caught that connection there at the end. If you haven't listened to that previous one, I suggest go listening to it now because it'll connect at the end as well. And it's just really great how they both tie together. Um, but yeah, thanks again for listening, everyone. I know this is not something we normally do here, but I'm beginning to really like it. I think I might just do one one. Maybe do one once a week or so. You know, just bring it back. People really seem to enjoy it, so why not? But, until then, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and as always, stay safe out there.